Hello and welcome to Eco Elsa, where I also bring you videos to help you get your kids outside. Except this week. This week we're going to be going over educational animals, or aka a classroom pet, and the five factors to consider when picking one, whether you're a teacher or a parent. So, let's get started. This video came about after some discussions with teachers and friends about uh, animals and animal care and the big things to keep in mind when picking one. So these five factors are things that I've decided are the most important that you should really, really consider when picking a classroom animal. So this is by no means an all-inclusive list of every little detail you should consider. So all I ask is make sure you're doing additional research in addition to this video. Think of this video as a starter for here are the big things I should really keep in mind so that I pick the right animal for me and my classroom and so that I'm the right person for that animal. Because this is all about making a happy, healthy home for your animal and providing it with the best care that it needs. And also so that you aren't stressed out every day taking care of something that is just not a good fit for you. And that's fine because this is something I'm passionate about. Um, educational animals are a great resource to use in your classroom to help teach and educate your students, but as well as for your kids to learn things like responsibilities for taking care of animals, the proper care that animals have different needs, um, feeding, you know, you get to learn a lot when it comes to having an educational animal, so that's why I highly recommend them. Also if you're in a school where you don't really have a lot of natural space outdoors available, Having an educational animal is a great way to bring the nature inside. You can learn about the habitat this animal traditionally would be found in in the wild. So the very first factor is the animal itself. How big it's going to get, how long it's going to live, and what type of an animal it is. So starting with the size. For most beginners, I recommend you getting a smaller animal. Usually an animal that's about less than a foot that's going to be spending most of its time living in its tank or its home. You want a little animal, not a big animal. Little, little, cute baby animal. Well, not baby, but little animal. Cute little animal. Not They won't stay babies forever. So don't get a little baby animal and then all of a sudden it's a big animal. The second part of this is how long is it going to live? Animals can live a variety of lengths of time. It could live about a year long and that's a typical lifespan for it all the way up to 50 or 80 years long. So keep in mind how long you want this animal to be around for and kind of make a range. The minimum age you'd want to have the animal for and the maximum range. Lastly is the type of animal and this comes down kind of more to what you're comfortable with and what your school allows. Many schools have very strict no fur no feathers policies and what this means is they're not allowing animals into the school that uh, teachers or students could be allergic to. This leaves you with a lot of our scaly and slimy friends, our amphibians and our reptiles, which now you need to decide what you're comfortable with. If you as a teacher are, or a parent, you're afraid of snakes and spiders, a tarantula or a boa are probably not good fits for you. And that's okay. We want to fit, find the best fit for you in your class and make sure you're a good fit for that animal too. Part of this you should also be making sure this is an animal you feel comfortable handling because you never know when you might have to pick it up. So even if you're like, well I have a tarantula but I never have to pick it up, it can just stay in its tank. You don't know that. You might act, it might kind of get out because a kid knocks the lid off. It happens. So make sure it's something you feel comfortable picking up. The second factor is what it eats and how often it eats. Animals eat a variety of things. You could have everything from something that's eating fish food and fruit to something that eats live insects and mice. So you need to make sure you're comfortable feeding it whatever it needs to survive because a snake is not going to live very long eating fruit, if at all. And it might get pretty crabby before it dies. In addition to what your animal eats to survive, it might be a picky eater. So say you're comfortable feeding, feeding uh, already dead thawed out mice to a snake. Well, if that snake's a picky eater and it only wants to eat live mice, then you and your kids are going to have to get comfortable feeding that snake live mice. So make sure you're paying attention to, oh, this is what this animal eats on the list. 
Now the other thing that's nice about this is you can pick an animal that eats a lot of the same food as you. Many lizards are great omnivores and in addition to eating insects, they eat a lot of the same leafy greens and fruit that we eat. Uh, the next part is how often they eat. Some animals, like snakes, can eat about once a week or once every two weeks and they're pretty good. Other animals are more similar to cats and dogs and they need to be fed pretty regularly every day. So now, you, if you're a teacher, you have to think about, well, what is the animal going to do over the weekend? Are you going to be coming into the classroom to feed it on the weekend? Are you going to ask someone else to feed it on the weekend? Are you going to be bringing it home every weekend and then back to the school? So make sure you're paying attention to how often this animal is recommended to be fed. And bringing this up, there's a lot of different research online. This is a lot of different things. Make sure you're using credible sources for the specific needs of your animal. Usually um, sites that are all about the care of this specific animal, even if it's a forum, are usually pretty good. And you can go through a lot of different information and find what's the most consist consistently recommended care for this animal. Otherwise find someone who specializes in this animal or breeds it for a living. Odds are they're going to know what they're talking about and have some really good points and tips for you. Factor number three, the habitat requirements. So this is going to be the home your animal is living in. So obviously you want to provide it the best home you can possibly provide it to live in. So this is things you're going to have to keep in mind are things like the temperature, the light, the water, the size of the tank, and the furniture in the tank. So let's start with the temperature. Most animals have an optimal temperature that they're the most comfortable in humans included. Now animals are no different. They have an optimal temperature. You might need to get a heater or a, a cooling device of some sort. Make sure that either the room is regularly the right temperature and that's also checking for at night because school temps change at night when no one's in the building or on the weekends. So make sure you either have a heater or a cooler so you're keeping it the right temperature for your animals. Next is the lighting in the tank. Many animals require specific lighting to fit their needs, especially reptiles. A lot of times they need a UVB bulb, which is going to give them UVB radiation. The reason they need this is because it helps them absorb calcium from their food. And reptiles, like many animals, need calcium for their bones, but also for their bodily functions. Um, a lot of different animals, if they don't get the calcium they need, in addition to having brittle bones that easily break, also could have seizures and a variety of other health problems. So make sure if it's an animal that needs calcium in its diet and it absorbs its calcium through uh, sunlight, that you're getting the correct lighting for the tank to help them out. You don't want your little buddy having little seizures because they're not getting the calcium they need. That'd be sad. And be really, you know, hard in front of your kids or your students. Okay? Third is the water. So what kind of water does your animal need to survive? Now this is kind of talking about how it's getting its water. Some animals need misting throughout the tank because they get it through the air, or they lick it off of leaves on the surface. Other animals need a little small water dish that they can drink out of, or a bigger water dish that they actually can swim around and move in. Or maybe your animal lives in water all of its life, and you're going to need to make sure there's enough water in the tank so it has enough room for swimming around and moving around. Additionally, for a lot of animals, the water that comes out of our tap isn't the right kind of water for them or, or safe or healthy for them. Uh, basically, a lot of tap water has chlorine in it, and chlorine can be uh, toxic to deadly for a lot of different animals. So make sure you're properly treating and conditioning this water so that it's good for your fish or it's good for your amphibians and your reptiles, okay? You, you're climbing around. Kiki's in her little play box next to me, so I got my little buddy out while I'm filming, just multitasking, like a good lizard mom or lady of the lizards. I really do like lizards though. They're so cute and they make such good uh, educational animals, but also pets. As long as you know what you're doing and you take care of them well. My little buddies. I love her so much. She's so cute. What are we talking about? Oh yeah, the tank. Fourth when it comes to the habitat is the size of the tank. Make sure you're getting the proper size tank so that your animal has enough room to move around. Make sure it's big enough that the animal can turn around and move around comfortably. You want it big enough for them. You don't want to be cramming a three foot long iguana into a four foot long tank. Like that's, no. That would be like you being trapped in on your bed. Oh look, you can kind of like scrunch your body and like twist around and then you moved around. 
Like, no, give them enough space that they can move around. Most animals, usually if you're doing your research online, they have recommendations for the right size tank for them. And lastly, when it comes to the habitat your animal is living in is the furniture, the things that you're putting in the tank. A lot of animals have different needs or requirements to make it a rich environment for them to live in. So many animals climb, like Kiki, she's a climber, she's arboreal. I mean, she, li she traditionally lives in trees. So you need to have things for them to climb on and move around because they're not gonna be spending a lot of time on the ground. Otherwise, maybe your animal it needs a basking rock to sit on, or maybe it's a turtle and it's swinging around its tank and it needs some kind of rock structure to climb out of and sit on, or a log. So make sure you're providing the right kind of tank furniture so that your animal can be happy and healthy and get their needs met. Make them a fun, happy home. And the nice thing about f uh, furniture is that you get to rearrange it and make it really fun for them and make really cool things. I know my fiance really likes this, is re the, each month he gets to rearrange her tank and make it new and make it better for her. And there's a lot of fun features now for animals that live in tanks. You have things like lizard hammocks where they have a hammock in their tank that they can sit and lay in if they'd like. And those are really fun. Factor number four is cleaning. How to clean your animal's home and how often to clean your animal's home. Now, many animals will have different requirements when it comes to cleaning, especially at which cleaning products you can use. Some animals, soap is a no-no, it's a bad idea because they could get really sick if they ever accidentally ingested any of it. Even if you're being really good and you're rinsing the tank out, there's other safer options. So do your research, but you need to know how you clean this tank because this is this animal's regular home. This is where they're eating a lot of the time, unless you have a separate feeding tank like some people do for turtles and snakes. And it's also where they're going to the bathroom a lot of the time. So you're going to be picking up after them, the same as you would a cat or a dog, but at least on a little bit smaller scale. So you need to make sure you're regularly cleaning out their home so that way there isn't a lot of waste building up and they could possibly get sick or you could get sick. Because a lot of animals will carry uh, things that can make people sick like E. coli or salmonella. So you got to keep that in mind if you want to keep your animals safe, you and your kids safe. You gotta regularly clean it and keep it a clean environment. The how often part kinda depends on your animal and how often the tank gets messy. Usually for most animals that are in a tank, a safe thing is about a monthly like full on clean out, take everything out, rinse it off, soak it. But each week, or even every day, if you see a little pile of waste of droppings, you pick it up flush it or throw it away. But you should be doing what makes sense for your animal based on your research and for you and your class so that you aren't getting a stinky smelly tank in your classroom because that's not going to be fun and that's not going to encourage learning for anyone. And the fifth and final factor to consider, especially for teachers, is what are you going to do on breaks with this animal? If it's a week-long break or it's summer break, for the most part, most animals, you're not going to want to leave them alone in the school, unattended in a building that the power might go out or something, and then your animal could get, you know, sick and die. Also, most animals need water every day, so you're going to need to make sure the water is being filled up. So, leaving an animal unattended for weeks on end, usually not a good plan. So you're going to have to decide what's going to happen. Is this an animal that you can bring home to your house or your apartment? Or is this an animal that you're going to need somewhere, find somewhere for it to go over breaks? Maybe you have friends or family who could take the animal in for the summer if you can't. Or maybe you'll have to find, see if you can find a student every summer who can take the animal in. Whatever the case may be, you need to think about this before you get the animal. If you have a landlord, talk to them and decide you know, whether or not you can have the animal in your apartment. Because different apartments have different rules. Or maybe it's at your house. Make sure it's a good home situation for your animal. If you already have cats and dogs and things in your house that might try to break into the tank, it might not be a good place for your animal. I mean, that's part of the reason why Kiki was rehomed, and I'll get to that in a little bit here with her little story. And lastly, I can't stress it enough, I know I've brought it up multiple times throughout this video now, but do your research. If there could be a final tip all into itself, would be just 
do your research. Learn about these animals as much as possible until you can decide which one would be a good fit for you and then learn enough about it so that you can take care of it well and provide it all the things it needs, its food, its habitat. You understand how much this animal is going to cost because some animals can be a little bit more expensive when it comes to adopting them to begin with if you don't have an animal that's just a freebie that needs to be rehomed. But they also can cost a lot monthly when it comes to their food. So if I would have a final six tip, it would be do your research, as much research, too much research, so that you know anything and everything you can find about this animal that is out there. So that you're ready and prepared to welcome it into your home or your classroom and provide it a good habitat. And now the moment you've all been waiting for, just a little fun Kiki little moment. I'm gonna take Kiki out so you guys can see her and tell you guys a little bit more about her story if you haven't heard it yet. Na Sepena Rabicio. Now, part of the reason why it's a little more dark in here is because Kiki is nocturnal. She is a crested gecko. See? I got her over a year ago from a friend of a friend, and uh, she was in a home, and the home wasn't the uh, best uh, situation for her at least. The previous owner already had a cat and a dog, and the cat would break into the tank and uh, pot her and kind of chase her around. And so she used to have a tail and she lost it from stress. Um, and she's a type of lizard that they don't grow back her tail. So she's gonna have a little nub the rest of her life. And that's okay. Um, for the most part, she makes it work climbing. Uh, sometimes it can be hard for her to climb vertical surfaces because uh, the tail would have a sticky type part on it, like her toes here that are hanging onto my fingers. That tail offsets the weight of her big head. So when she's climbing, sometimes her head will make her fall backwards. She's my little cutie. Um, for about the first six, eight months, I worked with her handling, so she got comfortable with me so that I could handle her without her getting scared. And in addition to climbing, which she still really likes to do and does often, she really likes soft fuzzy blankets. A lot of times she'll fall asleep on me on a fuzzy blanket and then I'll go to try and put her back in her tank and she won't let me. I only take her out of the tank for enrichment when she wants to come out. So what she'll do is she'll climb up the side of the glass tank and she'll put her little paws at the top and she'll look and peer at me like, aren't you gonna open the lid? Come on lady, open the lid, I wanna come out. And so I open up the lid, she crawls on out, she'll crawl up into my hand like this and then I'll put her into a play box like the one I have sitting next to me. Oh honey, do you want to get warm? As you can see, I'm representing here with my Mother of Dragons t-shirt. One, I'm a big fan of Game of Thrones, but also I really love lizards because they're kind of like little dragons. Um, I've decided lizards are going to be my little buddies. My goal in life, if you want to know, is to be a lazy lounging lizard lady. To be one of those ladies who lays out on a sun chair with a couple of lizards laying on her. Kiki probably won't be one of them, huh? Because Kiki's nocturnal and she does not like bright lights, hence why she's turning her back to you right now. But she's a cute butt, right? You got a cute butt? Are you just looking at me because you can see my hair? It's another thing. She really likes climbing through my hair. This is my Kiki and part of the inspiration for doing these videos because I love her to death and I like providing her, there she goes, to the hair. I like uh, providing her with a good home that's happy and healthy. She could live to about 15 to 20 at the oldest, so I hope to have her sticking around, maybe making an appearance here and there in a video. And uh, of course my fiance Andrew adores her. She is going to get so spoiled that he's talking about getting her a bigger tank. So yeah, she's... oh hi, am I Rapunzel? Okay. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for for today. So I hope you liked today's video and liked seeing Kiki when you learned a lot about selecting an educational animal for your classroom or your home. If you have more questions about educational animals or selecting the right animal for you, please comment below and I'll answer them as best I can or get you some resources that can better answer your questions. Um, if you're looking for more resources to help you get your kids outside, make sure to uh, check out my description. I got links to my email list which you can join so that you can get a monthly email with tons of resources to help you get kids outdoors. As well as I have links to my social media accounts. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. As well as a blog with lots of resources to help you get your kids outdoors. So make sure to take advantage of that. 
Uh, lastly, make sure to subscribe or uh, ring that little bell so that way you can be notified when my videos are up to help you get your kids outside as well. So I hope you all have a fantastic week. You be safe, learn lots, have fun, and get your kids outdoors. Bye!